welcome back. It's always good to get a, a repeat. And so it's great to see a bunch of new faces. Um, I myself am very jealous because I would have loved to go to a workshop like this whenever I was you know, coming up to speed on these things. And so um, I hope you find it useful. And uh, after we get through this, there's going to be a little bit of break. And so if you have any questions, I'd love to chat. So uh, without further ado, I would like to um, talk to you a little bit about how um, we underwent a project at Agilent really designed to take what Charles has just described for about the last 45 minutes and try to wrap that into a workflow that would allow us to be a little bit more high throughput in the um, isotope log type of tracking experiments that we might like to do in our daily research. So you know, there were a number of reasons that we, we wanted to you know, sort of evolve into this space. And as, as Charles alluded to, you know, metabolomics is a very, very valuable technique, but it, it sometimes, um, you know, just having a static picture of metabolism across a series of time points is useful, but it's not totally informative, right? So if we take a satellite picture of traffic at 2, 3, 4, and 5 o'clock, we can see exactly where those cars are at that period of time. We don't know how those cars got there. We don't know how fast they were going. Were they in gridlocked traffic? Or were they running at 60 miles an hour? We don't know where they are, where they went. And so it's nice to be able to do something like introduce a tracer that has an isotope handle on it, if you will, that we can use to trace that metabolite's journey through metabolism. And so that's what we wanted to do, is we wanted to expand into this area. And you know, so Charles mentioned another, you know, touched on another really good point um, that I want to make in terms of metabolomics versus when it may be necessary to do um, some sort of an isotope tracking study. So biology is very, very good at maintaining homeostasis, right? And we can, we can survive in all sorts of weird and funky conditions. And so there are certain pathways that are more tightly regulated than others, right? So think about central carbon metabolism, glycolysis, the TCH cycle, these energy pathways that are critical for life. Those are highly, highly regulated. And so just because we see a fold change in our metabolomics, you know, maybe it's over on some ancillary pathway and we think, wow, that's really novel. We found some pathway clear over here that's way away from anything we thought it might be. You know, that may just be what you, know, you might consider to be like a, a you know, blow-off valve. That may be the point at a time where it's not necessary for this particular pathway to be operating at maximum efficiency in order for the, the cells to still live and breathe. So we want to follow up with, you know, you know as a prelude to our, or excuse me, as a, as a post to our metabolomic studies, we need to concern ourselves with figuring out whether are all those metabolites following the pathways that we think, or are they, you know, is maybe that we're just seeing pathway activity somewhere else because there's a more serious problem of this regulation somewhere in more, more conserved regions. And so that's really, you know, kind of, I'd say, if, if I was to take first few minutes of Charles' wonderful talk, that was, that was it in one slide. So. Um, so the piece of software that we built, the workflow, if you will, that we built to, to try to address this, um, this problem and speed up the analysis of these type of experiments is called uh, mass center vista flux. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the, you know, the nomenclature and things like that, but there are a couple of terms that I want to you know, familiarize you with. One of which is obviously the, the argument between isotope logs and isotopomers. And so, as we already know, um, if you look at this specter here, at zero hours with no label, you know, we see a nice um, you know, endogenous profile of our metabolite, in this case it's fumarate. And after incubation with a C13 labeled tracer, after a few hours we start to see isotope logs come in. So we start to see substitutions of carbon one, two, three, and four, which we can see here in our isotope log distributions. So that's as far as this software goes. As, as Charles mentioned, there's, there are serious challenges that are accompanied with trying to do isotopomer characterization. So now we would take, in this case, the M plus one isotope log. And we can tell you that there's one carbon that's been substituted, but we can't tell you the position. If we could, we would be using something like a GCMS or NMR in order to give that localized information as to which specific carbon has been substituted with the isotope. And this is very valuable, don't get me wrong. This is how a lot of you know, the, the deeper, more, you know, I'll say the more difficult enzymatic questions can be answered because you can get a lot of insight into how a metabolite was formed based off of the position that that carbon is located in. But for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to be concerning ourselves with isotopologs. 
And I also want to make another point. Charles, you did a wonderful job illustrating this. I'm not going to even try to try to recompose it. This is what we call qualitative flux, which is also what we're referring to as relative flux. So we're not trying to create a kinetic model here and do a lot of extensive planning and computational um, work here to try to determine the absolute rates of metabolism. This is similar to what you would do with an unbiased metabolomics study, where you would be looking at the relative changes in abundance relative to controls. Okay? So, if I were to again consolidate Charles's talk down into a, into a single slide, this has been the workflow for a number of years. This is what I unfortunately got to do in graduate school for those that want to you know, track isotopes as they move through uh, a model system. So the first thing you want to do is you want to create a target list. So you know, as a researcher, you're going to say, you know, these are the pathways that are, are biologically interesting to me. So maybe it's, it's glycolysis and the TCA cycle. So you would need to take and determine which one of those metabolites you want to look at. Maybe it's all of them. If you really want to do a lot of uh, you know, cutting and pasting and work. And so then you're going to go out and you're going to calculate all the possible isotope logs for each one of those metabolites that you want to look at. So if it's glucose, you're going to have to calculate the natural abundance. And then with one carbon, two, three, four, five, and six substituted if you're feeding with um, uh, enriched carbon. So you'll extract out all those isotope logs, you'll integrate them, and you'll probably bring them into something like Excel so that you can start to make sense of some of the data. Um, you'll have to correct for the natural abundances that are, that are present, either from the endogenous metabolites or from the tracer that you used. And then you'll um, pick your, your favorite um, piece of software to try to visualize some of that content on the pathways. So the point I want to make here is that this is very time consuming. It's not adding a lot to your research. It's a, it is a bottleneck of, of tedious steps that are very easy to make a mistake in. Copying, pasting times hundreds and hundreds of isotope logs is, is dangerous at best. And so we wanted to look at making a a more robust way to approach this. And so we started looking at algorithmic ways that we might be able to extract the isotope logs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so this is the workflow that we created, and it relied a lot on some of the metabolomics tools that we'd already developed and that um, you know, users in the field were familiar with. And then we extended a few of the things to be able to do this kind of isotope log tracking. And so as I mentioned, you, know, you will create a target list. We have a couple pieces of software to help you do that so that you can specify the pathway or pathways that you're interested in seeing. You pull down those metabolites. You reference a library that you probably have already created that has retention times because that's going to be important to separate things out like isobaric interferences whenever we look to do the extraction. And then we're going to simply acquire data. This is going to be on an LC TOF or QTOF. It is MS level untargeted data collection. So we can come back and we can reprocess it as many times as we like in the future. We'll have it for eternity. And from there, we're going to extract the data using a piece of software that we'll talk about in more detail called ProFinder. And then we can visualize those results on the context of pathways um, using something that's called Omics Premium. So I want to give you just a little bit more technical detail on how to set up this kind of experiment. And then we'll actually do a little bit of a uh, video demo, provided the, the Macintosh here cooperates. So I did build the video on a PC, so we'll see. So first thing, of course, you're going to want to specify the pathways that are interesting to you. Uh, like I said, you know, you could use the central carbon metabolism example. Um, maybe pull down everything associated with glycolysis and the TCA cycle. You pull out your retention times, get those lined up, and then from there you really need to just determine the tracer. Now this is something that's going to be, um, you know, could be more globally, you know, use something like C13 glucose. It's very promiscuous. It's going to participate in a lot of pathways. You just want to see where a lot of label is going or maybe where a lot of label is not going. Or you can be, you know, more selective in the pathways, and I'll actually show you a case study that's going to kind of uh, illuminate some of that where you might pick a specific tracer to ask a very specific question about pathway activity. So we set up our target list. We know what we're going to look for in our metabolites. And then we just need to set the instrument up to acquire the data. So I mentioned this is MS level scan data. Um, there's a couple of considerations on the chromatography side. These are not new. These are standard metabolomics type of considerations. One is, of course, you need to be able to separate out anything that's isomeric in nature. So no mass spectrometer on the planet can contend with something that weighs the same. Right? It is the same. 
So you'll need to be able to separate out some of those, you know, citrate, isocitrate, things like that if you're going to be looking at them. And to an extent, you may need to also pay attention to making sure that there's sufficient separation of your iso of isomeric species that you don't have overlapping isotopologs because, again, if they weigh the same, then they're still going to cause you issues whenever you go and do the extraction. On the side of the mass spectrometer, um, you want to use something that has obviously good mass accuracy. The better the mass accuracy, the more efficient the isotopolog extraction will be in ProFinder. A couple of other things that you need to consider is um, isotopic fidelity. So somebody here give me the a 10 second explanation for what isotopic fidelity is and why it's important. I'll call on people, I promise. Okay. Charles. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we want the values of the isotopes that we are measuring to be as close to the theoretical values as possible. So if we look out and we, we can calculate you know, what the ratio of the isotope should be for anything, you know, that's, that's exact mass at its finest. So we want to be able to observe those as carefully as we can because we are, in fact, making an isotopic ratio measurement. That's what we're doing when we're measuring these isotopolog incorporations over time. So we want this to be very accurate or we're going to be going to be pulling out fold changes and things that are not real. They're just instrument variation. So the last thing we need to pay attention to is we want to have as much dynamic range and sensitivity as absolutely possible because we're thinking about metabolite pools that are going to be varying wildly in concentrations in order of orders of magnitude. And we're also going to be very, or monitoring variations in the isotopolog abundances across a time course, right? So they're going to start it out at zero and they're going to work their way up. And so we want to have good sensitivity across the board and we want to have good, or excuse me, good um, dynamic range in order to be able to make all these observations. So once we've created our target list and we have collected the data, we're ready to start mining it with the piece of software I talked about, which is called ProFinder. And so this is a piece of software that we developed probably about four years ago. And it was originally an untargeted feature extraction tool um, because we had a number of collaborators that were constantly asking us for some help on getting from that first step from raw data you know, collection to a compound feature format. They needed to have that in, a, in more of a batch style instead of a one, at a time, one data file at a time. And so we, we created this software with the ability to do targeted and untargeted feature finding. It now supports GCMS as well, so we can look at LCTOF, QTOF, or GCMS, and that's uh, single quad or QTOF data in targeted and untargeted. So it'll present the results to you as follows. You know, you'll have a chromatographic dimension here that's been recursively analyzed so that we can fill in gaps in our data matrix and improve, you know, fidelity of our results. We will see the mass spectral dimension here. And obviously, in the case of if we're doing isotopolog tracking, we will see a kind of a histogram plot of the, of the isotopes as they're incorporated into the, uh, across the time course. And so in this case, we're, we are looking at fumarate again. So we can see at time zero, we've got no incorporation. And as we move through from a half hour all the way to eight hours here in this particular time course, um, by eight hours, we've got a pretty significant incorporation of the M plus four isotopolog, which means all four carbons have been substituted. So now's the part where we cross our fingers. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of a sample. This is just a couple minute video, but I always find that people learn better whenever we actually see the software run and, and see how it, you interact with it instead of just from a more hypothetical perspective. So here we go. So what we have here is a simple time course. Oh, you're killing me. There we go. So apparently we will not be playing that video. Um, let me just back up a little bit and I'll, I'll actually give you some more details. So essentially with any um, you know, PC, we would be able to you know, do this. But since it's a Mac, I'll let it slide. You know, but, um, but so essentially we're looking at you know, inputting our data files. And the software has knowledge to look at the, at the handle, if you will, the extension on the data files and know it's LC. QTOF data, for example. Yes? Uh, 
Um, so all of the software that we build is tested in a Windows environment. Um, the reason why the video is not working is beyond me. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, like I've, I've played it dozens of times on a PC, so I, I don't know why it doesn't like the Mac. Oh, okay. I missed that part. So, but you know, essentially, you know, you're going to set your experiment up by loading in your data files. You know, so in this case, we had a time course of 15 samples. It already knows that it's negative ion data, and we simply need to give it some grouping information. So we're going to have those are triplicates from zero to eight hours. And from there, all we need to do is specify the target list that we created, the metabolite list that we're interested in looking for. We feed that to Profinder along with the data, and we've specified our tracer. That tracer can be in, excuse me, N15, C13, or deuterium. And we will need to go through and let the software do an out, uh, a natural abundance correction at the end. So we do need to define 99% you know, purity on our tracer or 98, whatever it is, so that it can go through and do that calculation at the end of the, of the uh, algorithmic run. So I want to take a step back now and, and actually dig into the algorithm with a little bit of detail. So I'm going to talk first about that verbally about how we approached this um, you know, question of how we could extract isotope logs in, a, you know, in the mass spectral dimension. And then I will actually pull up some spectra and let you see it real life so that we're not just talking about this from you know, a, a theoretical perspective. So um, you know, we fed the data. We gave it a target list that had molecular formulas in it so that it can calculate all the isotope logs that it needs. And it, we gave it the retention time so it can, dis, it can differentiate between isomeric species. So it's going to go out and it's going to start and do what we call a survey scan, which is more or less a, a wide M over Z and wide retention time tolerance window. And the reason we do that is we want to, um, you know, I apologize because I know some of the people in the room have heard this analogy, um, but I, I like it, so I'll use it. Um, if you are out stargazing and you, it's a full moon and you want to look at it and you bring out your big hefty telescope, if you start at full magnification, you're going to be looking all around half the night trying to find the moon, right? Because you're at full magnification. So if you start back, you pull back on the dial, and you find the moon, and then you zoom in on it, then you can obviously take a look at it. And we're sort of doing a similar thing here with the software. It's an iterative process where we're going to dynamically narrow the retention time and the mass to charge windows as we refine the data step after step. So we're going to start wide. We'll integrate those EICs. and then we'll start to clamp down on our tolerances. So it'll create some new EICs. It will disqualify ions as it goes. And once it's done, it's going to start doing some scoring. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it's going to score ions based on the number of, of isotope logs that it finds, how well they collute with each other, um, and the relative abundance and their target retention time, you know, how close they fall into that window. So from there, we've essentially determined the raw isotope log abundance. So we need to correct for any natural abundance contributors. And then we can basically be presented with the results like you saw in the, in the ProFinder window in the slide before. So if we now look at some real spectra, and it is reasonably complex, I don't want you to pin, pay too much attention to all the, the colorations, um, but the black represents the sum trace. And so that's the summation of all the ions that it found um, whenever it looked out for all the isotope logs associated with this particular C6 compound, which I think was glutamine, but uh, really doesn't matter. It's a C6 compound. It wouldn't be glutamine. So that's the first pass. That's our survey scan, if you will. And so you can see there's a few places where we could you know, postulate that our data is going to be living. So right here, what we have here is a very distinct, you know, if we add up all the, the isotope logs that we see here, these three, and that represents the sum trace. There's a place here that the data could be living. There's another spot here. There's another spot here and here. So what that looks like, if we blow it up a little bit, is we've certainly got some mass spectral information that we can work with, right? So we've got a wide retention time at this point. As you can see, it's about a minute wide. And if we look at our first place here, this could be um, you know, some incorporation of label, or this could be an unlabeled isotope cluster. It's really not clear yet which one it is. Um, second time point, this looks good, right? This might be a M plus two, three, and four. We've got you know, none of our molecular ion left. We've had really efficient 
you know, substitution of, of label come in. Same thing with number three. This looks kind of promising, right? We've got some, some ions coming in. And number four, we're not really sure. That could be complete incorporation, but we don't really know what this N plus seven is. And so one of the things that the algorithm is going to do, first of all, to help differentiate is it's going to look for things that have more signals than we are expecting to see carbons, right? So if I expect to see glucose, and I have seven carbons, that might be an issue, right? So the software is going to go out and it's going to differentiate based off things. So it's going to say, this guy, you go away. That, this, that's not possible with the, the criteria that you fed me. Same thing over here. This M minus one, this might be wonderful, but this is not within the scope that you've set. So there's a couple of things we can do right off the bat to sort of refine the data. If we go a little bit further, we start out you know, with our survey scan and we begin to dynamically narrow our tolerances, we're going to be able to exclude some things. So if we look at peak number two, it vanished altogether because it did not meet the uh, mass tolerances that we've set for those isotope logs that we're looking for. So it was completely discredited at that point. The M plus seven is, is rejected here. We already rejected the um, M plus one or the M minus one of the previous slide. So peak number one is out. That's an unlabeled isotope cluster as well. And when we're done, the only thing, the only two choose, choices we have left is full incorporation. So we could have M plus six, right? It could have been 100% substitution of carbon. We've got nothing left of our natural abundance. It's not very likely to have full incorporation. It could happen, but that's what we're talking about when we, whenever Charles mentioned things like steady state, you don't often get to that steady state point in these type of experiments. So luckily it's eliminated because it fails the elution profile test, which basically means it is outside of the retention time window that we specified. So in this case, it's pretty easy. Peak number three wins. It has the most isotopal logs. They co-elute. They're within the right retention time and mass tolerance that we're looking for. So this is how the algorithm works. And this is an iterative process. It will do everything um, for one metabolite or for hundreds. And unfortunately, the cool part about the video would have been that you could see how fast the data actually processes. And so something that takes days to weeks to manually extract, remember that slide that I showed you that talks about the manual processes you have to go through? Um, even on my humble laptop with 16 gig of RAM, you can process 15 metabolites, um, 15 data files in a couple of minutes. So it's very, very fast. And that's, that's the bottleneck that we were trying to solve, right? We want to take something that took a couple of weeks to do um, in a collaborator lab down to a couple of minutes. And that's, that's how we, you know, where publications come from, right? You spend all your time doing the biology, not crunching numbers. Whoops. No, we're ready. So once we figured out how to extract all of our isotope logs, we still need to do the natural abundance correction. And if there's any mathematicians in the room, you're not allowed to talk for the next couple of minutes because you will you know, make me look very silly. But this is simply a matrix multiplication that we can do in order to correct for the natural abundance. And so we know, theoretically, what those isotope abundances are going to be. So for our natural, our unlabeled products, right? So we can, we can calculate for that and have that pre-computed um, from the target list that we have. So essentially, we need to figure out what the real isotopolog abundance is. The other piece of information that we have available to us are the raw mine values that we found. So we're, we're literally looking for the delta between the two, right? So we can input the values that we've observed as our raw values. In this case, we have to do the inverse. That's why the minus one is there. And flip it around so that now we're solving for this term here. And we use a chi-squared minimization in order to basically apply the constraint that says we don't want any non-zero entities here, right? So that way we get a, a correction of the, of the isotope log plots. So at that point, once we've done that, we end up with something that looks like this. Or so for succinate, we have you know, our raw specter here where we can see the, you know, that 1.1%, if you will. And then once we're corrected, it pretty much cleans it up and goes away. So in this case, there was, in that third replicate, there was a tiny bit of incorporation that had happened at whatever this was, I think, 30 minutes. So from there, we've done all the isotope log extraction. We've corrected for natural abundance. And we have all that data curated in ProFinder and ready to bring it into um, this piece of software called Omics Premium to do the pathway visualization and, and you know, apply some context and see 
what's really happening in the biology. So this supports um, content from KEG, BioPsych, and Wiki Pathways, and you can import pathways and use them directly as you like. You can import multiple pathways and stitch them together. Or if you're really, really adventurous and have a lot of time in your hand, you can actually create your own pathways empirically. It has all the tools in it to build you know, what you need if you want to start from scratch. Um, most people will import something, um, you know, like in this case, we had the TCA cycle and glutamine biosynthesis, and we will connect them with that one reaction that we need to make it, make it a whole piece and move on. So you can modify to suit your more custom you know, research needs as you need to. Um, and then from there, we can do some statistics that we'll talk about. And we'll use some you know, more, I'll say, type of appearance tools, if you will, to really be able to look at a pathway and monitor the isotopes as they perfuse through the network. So to show you how this works functionally, we collaborated with Justin Cross at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And Justin's lab provided us with a model that is very easy to work with. So it has biology, which is well understood and characterized. And it also demonstrates very well in a setting like this because it relies on pathways that um, we're all familiar with, in this case, the TCA cycle. So this was a Cronda sarcoma bone cancer cell line. And this has a known mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase, or IDH2. And so this is a gain of function mutation. And so in normal cells, IDH2 catalyzes the conversion from isocitrate to oxoglutarate, or alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, in the case of this mutant, um, something else happens. We begin to overproduce this oncometabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate, or 2-HG. And this happens in massive amounts. I mean, there's even, you know, studies have shown micromolar levels of concentration of this stuff. So it's, it plugs up the salvage pathways. It just, it's, you know, floods the cell, if you will. So what happens is, not only does it, you know, plug up the salvage pathways, but if you look, depending on how good your eyes are, you can see that this is actually very, very similar in structure to oxoglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate. And so it also begins to inhibit the enzymes that are dependent upon alpha-ketoglutarate for regulation. And so what you end up with is um, permutation of things like the histone demethylases and dioxygenases, leading to a hypermethylated state of DNA, if you will. So what happens is you have a change in gene expression, which then causes things like oncogenes to emerge. You may have the suppression of tumor repressant genes and things like that, and the process goes on, and you can imagine what happens. We end up with some form of, of disease. So, nice experiment. We wanted to ask a very simple question, though. We simply wanted to figure out how is 2-hydroxyglutarate being formed? And so I talked about picking tracers that can be, that can ask very specific questions. And that's an area where we, we picked glutamine. It's proximal. It's very close to the question we want to ask. We simply want to know, what is this derived from, and how is it getting there? So normal biology would suggest that it would be going to the left, right? Glutamine comes in, our tracer, it would go around. It would be decarboxylated here, come around, and we would see 2-HG with four out of the five carbons labeled. Now, it could also, oh, I don't want to give away the answer yet. It could also be coming directly around the right and defying the laws of nature. So that's the question we want to ask. So we fed fully labeled C13 glutamine um, from zero to eight hours, and we monitored all the metabolites that you see throughout here that are in green. That's what we, that's, that was our target list, if you will. So if we look at, we start from our, our, our point of question, which is we want to see glutamine come in to oxoglutarate. And even as early as a half hour, we see that that's happening. We start to get full you know, substitution of all five carbons in as oxoglutarate. And this zoom in here is just to show you that the algorithm is actually doing a pretty nice job of differentiating between this much, much larger, um, it's not phthalate, is it? Interference ion at 147. So it's actually still picking up guys, topologs that are down near the very, very baseline here without any issue. So if we go to 2-HG and we look and see what happened. Lo and behold, we see not an N plus 4, but an N plus 5 being 
produced in rapid quantity by, or vast quantity by about eight hours. If we go over to succinate, so take the, the left turn on the pathway, we see a little bit of incorporation of label um, by eight hours, but as you can see, relative to our unlabeled species, there's not a lot going in that direction. And um, we've got some other visualization tools that'll make this more apparent, um, fractional labeling plots and things like that. But you can see, even just from the, you know, from ProFinder, you can see you've got a vast incorporation of label into 2HG within three and eight hours, and very little going to the left and succinate. So some of the visualizations that we can use to help us uh, make sense of the data are what we call metabolite nodes. And so you can set those up where they just have maybe one piece of information on them that's denoted by color, which you know, we can always be very visual beings. And so you know, show me some bright color that in indicates a fold change or fractional labeling um, or just label incorporation, for example. So we can pick and choose. We can use all of them if we want, and that's what we have here for, for all three of them. So we can see oxyglutarate comes in. We have a fold change here a little bit. That's what the red color indicates. Um, we have some uh, label incorporation, so it's slightly green, it's not bright green. And then we have fractional labeling taking place for sure. And then we can easily look and see, oh, well the majority of that label is definitely going into 2HG, there's not a lot of it going into succinate, right? Quilt plots are perhaps um, the most informative summary of your isotopolog information. So this gives you the time course and all the isotopolog results for each metabolite right here in this little box. So what we have here is zero to eight hours on the Y, and we have our isotopologs on the X. And so if we look at 2HG, we can see that at zero hours, you know, red indicates essentially 100% of natural abundance, which is what we expect to see. And as we move down through our time course, we start to see this turn a pinkish color, and we start to see the isotopolog over here come into um, our visual scanning mode. So maybe asking what's the asterisk here? So you can also apply some statistics and have them show up in this quilt plot. So you can do things um, as simple fold changes, you can do p-values, um, you can do a Welch's t-test if you like, um, and you can also do an ANOVA type of analysis. And so you can have different things, you can add an asterisk, you can have a star, you can you know, play around with whatever you know, symbol you like best. Um, but this is just another quick denotion that says, all right, well, even though I don't necessarily see any color here emerging yet, there was still something significantly or statistically significant happening by a half hour. The last one is that I really like is the fra fractional labeling plot. And that's where you can actually see, get a, get a relative idea. Like I said, this is not quantitative flux, this is qualitative. So we're getting a relative idea of how much carbon is going one direction versus the other with this question that we asked. So we start off again with oxyglutarate, and we see that, yeah, very quickly we start to get a lot of labeling, and so by eight hours, I mean, we're at roughly 80% of the metabolite pool is substituted with carbon, right? We're not looking at positions or anything like that, we're just looking at the total carbon pool of that metabolite. If we look to the left, we don't see a whole lot of incorporation, the red here being incorporation in the succinate. We see a little bit, so that means that there is a little bit, um, you know, of maybe the appropriate enzyme or, you know, the mutant is not 100% efficient at diverting it to 2-HG, but it's pretty efficient. So you can see by three and eight hours, we're, you know, we're at one-third, roughly two-thirds there um, of the total carbon pool has been swapped out for labeled species. And then this actually has no biological meaning at all. But I throw it in because um, one of the questions that I got the first few times I gave this talk was, well, how many carbons, you know, can you really look at? What's the, what's the limit in Profiner? And so this was oxidized glutathione. It's a C20. Um, we do lipids, you know, that are much bigger than that. So I just, I throw this in here so you can see that it's, it maybe takes a few more seconds to process 20 isotopologs than, you know, five or six. And so it's really not a rate limiting step here. It's uh, more of a pragmatic perspective of, you know, if you have a good PC, you can certainly process the data with, with ease. And one of the interesting things here is, you know, the glutathione pool is, is reasonably large, and so it turns over you know, much more slowly than, you know, some of the other metabolites. And so, in this case, we can see, just using this histogram type of plot here, we get these five carbon units of glutamine to start to come in that we've fed. And so by five and ten hours, you know, we, or three and eight hours, sorry, we have, you know, a, a decent incorporation of two of those five carbon building blocks that are starting to feed into the glutathione pool. 
So to kind of summarize a little bit, if we take a step back and we look at the entire pathway that we created, you know, we, we brought in the TCA cycle and omics premium, and we said, I want to, or, and, and glutamine biosynthesis, and we drew in this novel metabolite that we wanted to study. So we completed our pathway, if you will. Um, we brought in the data from ProFinder. We turned on our isotope or our uh, quilt plot so we can view our isotope logs. And we can quickly, you know, within a couple of hours, we had some good biological um, observations we could make about our data, right? And so that's really the conclusion of the talk here. So I've, I've given you kind of a, you know, a snapshot overview of, you know, taking something like Charles, what Charles talked about, which is, you know, the experimental design, the collection of data, what types of data you're going to be looking at, what things you can be looking for in the data in terms of the isotopes, isotope logs versus isotopemers, and just try to give you an idea of what a, a, I'll say, a commercial workflow looks like that allows you to do this work in a more high throughput setting, as opposed to um, something where you're going to be doing all those manual calculations. And so, there's the summary. You know, we basically showed that, you know, 2-HG was definitely derived from glutamine. We, we proved that. We proved the direction of the pathway as well. We can show that it goes to the right. And it's fast. Or it would have been fast if we could have seen the video. So, um, with that, I just, I do need to thank all the people, at least on the Agilent side, that have put up with all of my silly questions over the years. Um, and I should mention that, you know, Justin was not our only collaborator on the Vistaflux project. We had 14 worldwide including um, the core lab here. So Charles had a copy probably three years ago-ish or four years ago um, of the algorithm before it was ready for prime time and beat it up and helped us, you know, make it better. And so we have we owe a lot to, uh, to our friends here um, helping this product, uh, you know, reach the market. And so we hope it helps you. That'll take any uh, questions and I appreciate the time. Does the software support, sorry, does the software support triple quadruple data, GC triple quad? No, so it, it does need accurate mass, um, LC TOF or QTOF, okay. and it it must be, for better or for worse, it must be Agilent um, dot D files that it's working with. Okay. So, um, yeah, it must be accurate mass so that we can differentiate between, you know, use mass accuracy to our advantage whenever we go through and do the isotope log extraction. Another one, yes. Um, so dynamic range is simply, you know, how, if you look at it from an intra-scan perspective, you know, if, if I see the presence, let me go back a few slides. Um, so like here, you know, so you're looking at the presence of something very, very, very small in the presence of something, I mean, not large, but in this case, you know, there's a, what is that, about two orders of magnitude there. So the, you know, the beam-based instruments that we're working with here um, will span about five orders of dynamic range, and so it gives you um, a pretty, pretty respectable field of view to look at whenever you're thinking about concentrations of metabolite pools that could be varying by orders of magnitude. You want to be able to see as much of that without saturating the detector as possible so that you maintain your mass accuracy and things like that. Anybody else? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, uh, yes. Um, so the question is, are we planning on adding any other tracers? So right now, C13, N15, and deuterium are supported. Um, what I would say is, if you have a serious need, we probably would look at a few data files and see um, what it would take. I mean, it's from an algorithmic perspective, it's simply changing some numbers, right, in the background. Um, but obviously, the isotopal log extraction itself needs to be beat up for a while to see if there's any, you know, each time we went through, you know, we started with C13, for example, that was, um, we had the most data on, if you will, got the algorithm to a very, very robust state, and then went to nitrogen. And we learned a few things when we went to nitrogen. We learned a few more things when we went to deuterium. And so, um, you know, it's something that we could explore. Um, it probably wouldn't be an overnight process to, you know, to enable it. Anybody else? Awesome. I think we're ready for a break, right? Yes, we are. Cool.
Garrison, so a quick uh, announcement. So uh, several of you expressed interest in uh, lab tour. Please see Maureen after the... Uh,